Good afternoon. Uh, you are with the House Government Operations Committee. Uh, welcome back to day one of the legislative session. Um, I know that many committees were not meeting this afternoon in order to give members um, time to get home from Montpelier, uh, where we met this morning to um, uh, to adopt our resolution, allowing us to meet virtually for the first two weeks of session. Um, uh, however, um, as is often the case with government operations, we, um, we don't have any time to spare. <laughs> so we are going to get started uh, right here on day one. Um, and uh, I know that I've spoken to many of you individually, but I think for, for the friends following along from home, um, it'd be helpful just to sort of articulate the plan of what we're gonna do with our first couple of weeks. Uh, we have two urgent issues that we need to, to get off the ground um, ASAP, uh, one of them being the adjustment to the town meeting um, format, the same bill that we passed a year ago. Um, we will also want to move again this year, allowing communities the flexibility to either delay their town meeting to a time when it might be safer or when they might build a meet outside um, or communities could uh, could choose to adopt their um, their town meeting uh, budgets and and other business by Australian ballot. Uh, so that's the same flexibility they were given last year. That bill is going to start in the Senate, uh, which buys us a little bit of time to do our first order of business which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, but there's one other aspect of the town meeting bill that I believe will be um, coming over to us later in the week. And that is uh, simply a clarification for communities that you cannot use Australian ballot to permanently use Australian ballot. Um, meaning that uh, if your community has not previously uh, adopted um, an Australian ballot mode of, um, of doing its business for town meeting, you have to actually have a town meeting in order to do away with town meeting. And that is a clarification that helps um, some of the communities who uh, were concerned that uh, that that this uh, second year of um, of allowing Australian ballot might be the death knell of town meeting, and um, I think we will have our opportunity to discuss that as a committee. But does anyone have any questions about that or about the bill in general? And we can all um, get used to raising our little uh, our little Zoom hands, which now can be found under reactions on your. Um, on your menu. Anyone have any questions? Uh, Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you. I believe Essex adopted an Australian ballot back in June and did that by universal mail ballot. Um, would So June of 2020, would that have to be done at a subsequent town meeting or would, would that count retro? Um, so that is a really good question for Tucker Anderson, who's our uh, legislative counsel, who's gonna be helping us, I think, with this bill. Is that right, Amron? Tucker will be our, our counsel for this bill. Um, that's a good question because um, I don't know what would happen in the event that, that a community may have chosen to do that last year. All right, I'll save that question for him then, thanks. Excellent. And feel free to reach out to him um, by email this week to uh, to prompt people to be thinking about all of these various scenarios. Um, any other questions from folks about the town meeting bill that we expect to come over later this week from the Senate? All right, I'm gonna work to get us time on the committee agenda as soon as the Senate has their version of the bill sort of um, on its way over to us. And that way we can, um, we can begin our deliberations in order to uh, expedite turning that around as quickly as possible. All right, um, so the next order of business for us in this first um, couple of weeks of session is to get 
our redistricting process off the ground. And, um, and so you'll see on our agenda this week that we've got um, quite a bit of time um, dedicated to redistricting. Uh, members will recall that uh, the process for the House redistricting is a little different than the Senate redistricting in that we have this strange requirement that, that we have to pass an initial bill that sort of kicks off the, uh, the uh, time of official feedback to the legislature. Um, and then we take on that uh, feedback from all of the local communities in order to create the final bill that becomes the next uh, decade of legislative districts. And so uh, we are gonna start right in on, um, on a proposal for this initial map with the intention of getting it out to communities as quickly as possible so that we can um, start hearing from communities about uh, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of the feedback that we'll hear from communities is where, which neighboring communities do they have common interests with and would feel comfortable um, being in a district with or where um, conversely is there a mountain, for instance, dividing two communities that, you know, that may look perfect on a map and perfect in terms of their numbers, but not in terms of geography and in terms of the way people actually um, operate in the world. So um, we have with us today um, Amarin Abergeli and Nick Atherton from um, Legislative Council and uh, Nick is our map technician and um, and so I think what we'll do is is dive right in with them sort of on uh, on where we are with um, with the mapping process and then we will shift gears uh, after a quick break and uh, and jump right in to take a look at the map that we um, will move for this initial districting um, proposal. So Amarin, welcome and thanks for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. For the record, Amarin Abergeli, Office of Legislative Counsel. I have asked Andrea to post the presentation that I gave to you all back in December. This has sort of redistricting 101, the applicable statutes that we walked through at that time, as well as the um, constitutional requirements that uh, are in place for reapportionment of the House. Uh, some things to keep in mind. Uh, for what we're about to hear for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, Nick has put together a map that has the current districts as they stand presently, um, but this map has been updated with the 2020 census data. So with this map, you will be able to see all of those areas where the deviation um, percentage has, has changed. Um, as we discussed last month, ideally the, the House of Representatives has a, a certain number of Vermonters for every representative. And the more or less number of uh, Vermonters per representative results in a deviation from that ideal number. So when you're looking at the map that Nick is going to pull up, you'll see uh, the within the gray blocks, you'll see where those deviation numbers are. The deviation is a percentage, how many people over that ideal number or under that ideal number. Um, if it's under, obviously that will be represented by a negative percentage. If you have too many people, you have more people than the ideal number, you'll see a positive percentage point. So as we discussed briefly uh, back in December, there is case law about what uh, the constitutionality of deviations for percentages, the I would say the general rule of thumb for case law has been that if it's within 10% overall, that is five above or five below or two below and eight above, right? If you're looking at the overall range, then the presumption is that that number may be constitutional. Once you get beyond that above 10%, then it's it is then on the state to prove that the deviation is still constitutional, despite its large deviation. 
So that's just numbers to keep in mind as you're looking at this map. You'll see there's a pretty big variation now um, that these current districts have the 2020 population data put into them. So as you are looking at these maps moving forward, um, looking at those areas where the deviation looks very high uh, in either direction will be um, an indication that the committee likely needs to review that district and determine how it can be changed um, or whether it needs to be changed. So um, Madam Chair, did you want me to discuss briefly about the, the bill, the format structure of the bill for? Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Um, and after you do that, maybe you know we can have a, a bit of committee discussion or I can clarify for folks um, sort of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but you know, short answer, folks, is uh, the the redistricting timeline has uh, has been adjusted <laughs> due to the delay in the census, um, and there's some cascading impacts of that that I think are are um, continuing to uh, ask us to do things differently. So, go ahead, Amarin. Certainly. So as uh, the chair mentioned, within statute, there is a two bill process, and this is how it's been for a number of redistricting cycles. The initial bill will outline uh, districts at a, at a high level um, and does not include all of the ultimate detail in terms of meets and bounds that you will see um, in the final districts bill. So the initial districts bill will, for example, say that for Colchester, there will be four representatives or that for Burlington and Winooski, there will be 10 or 12. I don't recall what the exact number is, um, but you'll see that there are very large numbers of representatives assigned to, I would say these sort of big districts that will then typically be subdivided um, after hearing testimony from boards of civil authority, is that ultimately when you are ready to review a final district's bill, all of those larger districts, all of those larger towns and cities like Burlington, Rutland, Bennington, those will have been subdivided down into the constitutionally required one or two member districts. So the bill draft that you're going to see tomorrow will have those, those large districts, those large multi-member districts um, without the detail of how the subdivision will exactly work. Um, and this serves as a, as a starting point for the committee to notify boards of civil authority that along with a copy of the maps that you have initially looked at, um, so they can see where some of the details that you're looking at lie within each town, within each city. And then once you have testimony back from those boards of civil authorities, then you start filling in those details, the meets and bounds for those subdivisions when you're subdividing a town, for example. So that is a, a high level overview of what it will look like. This will make probably more sense once you uh, see the bill tomorrow, but that is the initial draft. Questions from committee members. Making sure so, that we give it an extra pause in case people have forgotten where to find their little hand raise function. Uh, Representative Hooper. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given the complexity of in-city boundaries, uh, if we know something now that doesn't make sense because of geographic stuff, uh, when is it appropriate to throw that in the soup? <laughs> so we are making a very simple soup here this first week, at least I hope we are, because, um, because we need a vehicle through which we can um, get a, a, an initial map out to communities so that we can start taking feedback. Um, and so I would, um, I would say hold on to the details of that, because what we're, what we're not trying to do in my mind at this moment is, um, is get in and start tweaking um, internal lines within different districts. Uh, what we really need to do is get to the, 
the place in the process where we we are having hearings with uh, the boards of civil authority. The the usual um, redistricting timeline would have had the le the legislative apportionment board delivering their maps to us back in August, and then the House Government Operations Committee in a normal time would have had hearings during the the fall with different communities so that they could you know, start this process with a lot of feedback from communities. And uh, because of the delay in the legislative apportionment board um, receiving the census data, they weren't able to finish their map uh, in time to allow us to do pre-session hearings. And so um, what, what I'm hoping that we can do here is really kick off the, this initial draft uh, with the intention of getting it out to communities so that communities can come back and say, you know, yay or nay, we like this, we don't like that. We, you know, we like being in a district with, you know, with East Whoville, but we don't want to be in a district with South Whoville um, because they don't have anything in common with us. Uh, so for right now, uh, you know, it's my hope that we can move through um, the, the Legislative Apportionment Board's alternative map. And there are reasons for that that we'll get into when we start looking at that map, but that we won't make changes to that at this point because, um, because I'd like us to hear from communities um, uh, before we start uh, um, moving district lines. And so I see representatives Lefebvre and Higley. Um, one of you has a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I do, uh, Madam Chair. Um, after uh, mentioning this uh, proposal of using the alternative map initially and uh, uh, talking with other reps and uh, Representative Hooper uh, brought up a, a concern of mine as well. Um, I guess we haven't had much discussion around using the alternative map right off the bat. And uh, some of the, the uh, concerns that were brought up to me, which make a lot of sense, and, it, and, it, and, it, and I found out that it can be done. Um, should we maybe not uh, look at some uh, changes ourselves initially and come out with that first map of ours, maybe the first part of March? I know we're under a time crunch here, but my concern is you've already had all these BCAs commenting on the minorities maps, the single seat districts. Now we're gonna have them commenting on the alternative map. And then that isn't even really gonna be what we're gonna be uh, looking at in the end. Um, so uh, again, I would, um, I'd like to at least discuss uh, why we can't work on an initial map, whether we start with the alternative map or not, uh, consider some changes ourselves and have a more closely uh, resembling what we might finish up with maps so that BCAs are actually looking at what might actually come down the pike. Am I, am I off base with that or what's, what, how are other people, how are the members feeling? I'm happy to have committee discussion on that. Um, I'll wait for, for little yellow hands to pop up if folks want to weigh in. Uh, Representative Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my concern with changing the map at all at this point is that you basically are opening a can of worms and, and you know, it could lengthen the process for quite some time. And, and I think, you know, sticking with what is the alternative map um, is an approach to get a bill out quickly. Um, because I mean, once you start moving one town around or, or one district around, it leads to moving another district around and, and it becomes a never ending process and would probably come up with an entirely different map than the alternative proposal that's out there. And given that we're trying to do this in, in a expedient fashion, um, I think sticking with what um, is the alternative, at least for initial bill, is fine. And, and I mean, I think it's important to communicate that to members so that they understand that. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My understanding was there are several uh, districts who are um, happy to be uh, two representatives for a single political unit. And um, those would 
and that's been communicated, if you will, already to the um, reapportionment board. So if you go back to the majority proposal, all those ones that said, we're fine, we don't, we're okay with two people in a single political division, those now unravel in addition to the ones where the population change is requiring us to attend um, to the number of delegates for even a large block unit. So if I can summarize, I think you're creating uh, by uh, going back to the first majority proposal of all singles, you're uh, in essence um, uh, revisiting some that uh, appear to be satisfied with a two-person district and, and thus eliminating that segment of our work. Thanks. Uh, Representative Higley. Yeah, again, I wasn't suggesting we go back to the uh, uh, majority's map at all. Um, what I am saying, and I agree with Representative Gannon, no matter when we start this process, there's going to be huge amounts of change. Um, and, uh, you know, I've already had representatives come up to me and said, geez, uh, we worked out and, and got uh, our district pretty much all set with, uh, you know, the towns and some BCAs and all that. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But uh, how did you do it and what other towns were affected by it? So, um, again, I, I'm, I'm not advocating going, you know, putting out the uh, majority's map initially, but I would, I just, I just think it's, we're going to, we're going to have huge changes once we start anyway. And I know we're under time crunch, but I don't know if it's fair for BCAs to uh, look at a map that's, uh, that's going to have huge changes and we're going to have to go back to them when we make the changes anyway. Again, I'm, I'm not convinced. I know the whole um, time crunch problem, but uh, I, I can see it's going to be a problem no matter what. Yes, and, uh, and, and this proposal is really a vehicle to get us more quickly to the point where we're hearing uh, directly from the communities. Um, whereas if we, uh, if we start trying to move district lines now with, without having had the benefit of the public hearings that in you know, previous decades, the House Government Operations Committee would have had public hearings already before we got to session in January, um, and would have much more on the ground knowledge. Um, we, uh, we were unable to do that this year. And, um, and so we need to find a way to get more quickly to hearing that feedback. And, um, and that's, uh, that's the real the intent behind this proposal. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have to retrain myself on how to use my iPad. Um, is it my understanding that the majority plan that's out there now that the boards of civil authority and other interested parties have had an opportunity to weigh into that already. And by going with the minority report, I guess if that's how we're phrasing it, that this gives them an opportunity to weigh in on that as well by getting it out the door so to speak, earlier. Is that part of the intent here? Um, so for boards of civil authority who weighed in with the legislative apportionment board on their adopted map, we have, uh, you know, we have access at, at this point to, the, uh, to all of that feedback because they've been logging it as they go. Um, and, uh, and for many of those communities who were paying close attention to what the legislative apportionment board was doing, they also probably already uh, watched the, um, the presentation of the alternate map, the one that wasn't adopted. Um, and, and so in some ways, this is putting something out there that many communities are, uh, are somewhat familiar with already. Um, and may give them the opportunity to more quickly turn around uh, some feedback to the legislature so that hopefully by the third week of January, we could begin um, doing uh, public hearings. And, and it would be my intention that the public hearings would be done geographically so that when we have 
um, you know, neighboring communities coming in, we will be able to um, recall, you know, these two towns said they wanted to be together. These two towns said they don't want to be together. Um, and that we would look at regions of the state um, in geographic pods. Uh, but in order to schedule those hearings, we've got to, we've got to have uh, this initial bill out the door so that we have something for them to respond to. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My, the characterization that I brought up a problem is not what I intended. I brought up a process and when we would have input. Um, I fully agree that we should move forward as you're proposing. Uh, if we start the domino effect of moving a line here or there now, we're just going to play dominoes for the rest of the session. Um, I know that in Burlington's deliberations on this, they addressed issues with the minority map. So we should already have, you know, a good start on a lot of this stuff. So I'm all for gung ho moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Representative McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I really uh, agree with the idea of putting the uh, minority report map out toward the BCAs. You know, when you look through the feedback that we got from the BCAs on the adopted lab proposal, the majority map, um, there's a real spectrum of feedback, um, and some communities um, didn't provide feedback. Um, the, the twin opportunity for us to get a jump so that we're really um, doing the meets and bounds and the, the nitty gritty work when we're together in person, hopefully, and um, just doing that tweaking once uh, to Representative Hooper's point, um, that seems very attractive. It also seems really attractive to me to give the BCAs an opportunity to take a look at a map that's already, you know, been thought through in terms of, uh, the deviations and, um, the other requirements and statute that we haven't really even talked about all that much here. Um, so I, I would really welcome that information before we start doing all the bounds. And that's why I, I definitely support uh, moving this map out, getting that feedback, and then we do our nitty gritty work. Thanks. Other committee discussion? Well, I think to the extent that you all are hearing from, um, from colleagues in the legislature, because I know that even in the brief time we were in the building this morning, um, uh, just passing our resolutions to allow us to meet remotely for two weeks, uh, I was approached by I think as many members as, as I walked by who wanted to talk about redistricting. This is a really big deal. And I, and I recognize that. Um, and this, uh, the, this idea of moving out with the, um, with the LAB's alternate map is in no way um, saying that that's what the final district lines are going to look like. This is uh, this is simply a means to um, to put another valid proposal out to the communities um, in the same way that the LAB's adopted map was put out to the communities, and uh, and get us to the point where we're hearing feedback from uh, communities. I mean, it it was really heartbreaking to me to recognize it as uh, as Delta was surging late this fall that it wasn't gonna be possible for us to do regional meetings out in the community so that we could go to um, places around the state and, and actually sit down in person with people. And uh, little did I know, um, you know what, what the case numbers were gonna look like uh, now in January, um, but you know, we, we have a duty to listen to Vermonters and listen to the people who are on the ground in, in the different communities um, and to, uh, to put those, um, uh, those local knowledge and, uh, and local preferences into our thinking process as soon as possible. Um, and, and that's really the purpose behind moving forward with this, uh, with this plan. Um, so, Nick, I'm going to give you a moment to uh, to tell folks about the several pages um, that are in the um, document that that is listed on our website under your name and um, welcome you to there's two different documents there uh, 2010 boundaries with 
2020 census numbers and the LAB alternate. So um, if you could just help orient members to how to read those, um, we are all calling, we're able to call them up on a secondary device and look at them while we, um, while we stay in the committee room here with ourselves. So um, if you wanna just tell us what the different pages are of each of those maps, that would be helpful. Sure thing. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so again, Nick Atherton, uh, mapping specialist working with the Office of Legislative Council um, during this process. So uh, as um, was alluded to earlier, we have two documents for today in the mapping um, side of things. We have uh, a district map of 2010s decided upon and currently enacted districts with 2020 populations. Um, and that should be available on the um, committee uh, agenda for today on the website, Tuesday, January 4th. Um, and that would be under, under, my, under my name. That's number, that's the first one under my name. Uh, downloading that, I'm gonna pull that up, this up on the screen share in just a second. We can work on that, but just I wanted to give everybody the means to get um, into this information on their own first. So that uh, map uh, is a statewide map, purple boundaries titled 2010 District Boundaries with 2020 po Census Population. And it's a three page PDF with um, six, or sorry, four inset maps of um, urban areas around the state that I um, put in there just so that people can get a better look at the detail areas of some of these smaller districts. Um, the second one that might be useful is the LAB Alternate Statewide Districts Map 2020. Uh, this is, uh, a, 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 as we discussed earlier, this is the uh, alternate uh, plan that has been mapped out. Uh, it has one inset map of the Burlington area, and uh, we can pull up the uh, dynamic version of this and take a closer look at it later on if we'd like to. But those are both available, and I'm happy to answer questions about those. Um, I'm now, uh, sorry, actually, in fact, now probably now is a good time. Does anyone have any questions about those? or how to access them. Uh, it looks like Representative Lefebvre has her hand up. Thank you. Um, so I just had a quick clarifying question. When you go over and hover on the, there's a lot of different little boxes, but it looks like the new orange one one, and then the, it's right by Washington three and Washington one. Um, there's a lot of red boxes, which for me indicated that was a break in the district, but it has Williamstown as like its own district and Orange is its own district. I don't know if some lines got a little scrambled there. Uh, or Representative, if I could get help just... Sure. Representative Lefebvre, are you talking about the, uh, the alt plan, the alternative plan or the 2010, uh, the older district? Oh, the alternative plan. Oh, gotcha. Um, Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, now we're now we're seeing exactly the, the challenges that remote map viewing and creation are going to, to bring up. So uh, and that that district again uh, was. New Orange 1-1. One, one. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It was. Yeah. My dogs get excited when they hear people and they're relearning Zoom. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see, new Orange 1-1. One, one. Yeah, that. Um, I believe what you're seeing there is actually just some uh, is just uh, the line, the, the district boundary lines themselves um, be, just being sort of confusingly large and obscuring where the actual lines are going to go. So one thing that we can do is pull up the, like I said, the dynamic version of this, which is going to provide us with some better, more accurate detail of that. And the other thing too, is that sort of in the, uh, over the course of today, I've realized that when I'm creating these static maps and distributing them as PDFs, it's going to be worth it to create separate pages with certain urban areas, among those being Barrie and Montpelier area, so that questions like this can be preempted and, and, and uh, the, the information can be, can be displayed more, um, more clearly. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I understand this is all like a learning as you're running situation, but when I looked at it, it, did, it did look a little fun for a minute there, but thank you. <laughs> Representative okay. King. So, <clears throat> Rep Representative Lefebvre, if you, are you using an iPad to look at the maps? Currently, 
Yeah, well, if you, you can actually blow it up if you use your fingers. And so you can see the new orange one one if you really focus in on it. Um, you can see it a lot better if it's blown up. And so you can see it's, it's Williamstown and orange and part of Washington if you blow it up. I don't know if that helps you, but. Let's see if I can see if those are lines between there. So. Oh, Ooh. yeah. I think One second. You can it's going to take two of us. It's going to take right. two. It's a good thing you guys are helping oh, each other out. And, and you, uh, there's the block, that black block in like the 5.71% is blocking where the one little straw through is covering. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and folks, I think that this is uh, this is illustrative of why it's um, going to be challenging for us to be editing maps in this kind of a format because um, we have to choose how uh, how we ask Nick to create a map to distribute to us when it goes out on a, as a static document as a PDF and. Uh, and the width of the district lines and the size of the labels on the boxes is really, um, you know, it's it it's built for viewing the entire state. But when you zoom in to the individual districts um, on a static map, we we see those challenges. I mean, you can't even see you can't even see Barry City's district because it's completely encompassed behind the the Washington three um, label on here, and so. Um, I admit is my hope that by the time we get to actually moving district lines, as we, uh, you know, after we've had a chance to hear from the communities that we will be back in person in the building where we all have uh, much more ability to, um, to see what we're doing. Um, so Nick was pausing for questions. Does anyone else have questions about um, how to read either of these two maps? or how to access. All right, Nick, anything else? Um, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I think, no, that that actually, um, you brought up, I think probably the main issue that we're going to be dealing with uh, when it comes to this technology, which is a certain amount of um, conflict between being able to display maps that show the whole state um, and a snapshot, and then also maps that are able uh, to show uh, detail to the level that um, we're going to need to be able to complete this process. So that's what I'm here to do is to help manage that conflict. Um, and with that being said, um, I think it's probably good that we, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, if we, if I share my screen and show what the uh, stat with the, the current map looks like, um, and a, in a way that we can manipulate and just demonstrate some of the ways that we're going to be able to communicate with one another about um, viewing these maps live. Sure. Okay, here we go. We just need to make sure that you've been made a co-host. There we go. You are a co-host. Okay. Okay. Um, now I'm unable to see my own screen. So is ever is everyone able to see what I'm seeing? This should be a statewide map. Yes. And um, so folks, um, I want to give you a moment to, uh, you know, to orient your own screen. If you are zooming and looking at the screen, you, you may want to shrink down the, uh, the size of our little um, boxes so that you can see more of uh, Nick's screen. But um, Folks, feel free to contact me afterward if you want to talk through different ways of doing this that make it work better for you. But go right ahead, Nick, and walk us through what, what you're doing here on the map. Sure. So what we're currently looking at is uh, our, our current 2010 as drawn uh, uh, districts with um, the numbers, as Amarin alluded to, the, census, the 2020 census numbers. So let's just take a quick look at one district as an example. And we will use my area of the world, the Addison County area, um, as an example. So here we see, here we see Addison 1. Uh, on this, we have Middlebury, 9,152 people. Addison 1, six, uh, uh, that's the district label, Addison 1. 
The percentage is, as Amarin alluded to, the deviation from the ideal, and then 9,152 in this within this gray box here refers to the gross population of that district. So you'll notice over in Addison 5, we have a negative deviation of 13.18% and a total population of 3,722 people. But that district encompasses New Haven, Weybridge, and Bridport. So that totals to 3,200 or 3,722, whereas Middlebury is just a single district with, uh, the, with the town itself of Middlebury. So that's why the population totals match one another on the town and on the district itself. Um, let's see, a uh, couple other notes. We don't have a legend going right now because this is a draft map that we're looking at, but the uh, green dotted lines indicate town subdivisions or city subdivisions, um, and the purple lines indicate um, district uh, divisions. So often the, the reason you won't see too many green lines is because most of these districts run along um, uh, town or city lines, but where they don't, it's because um, they have been drawn to either have multiple towns in the same district or because the district line follows some other geographic or demographic features such as a census block or uh, a river or some other kind of, um, some other kind of boundary. Um, let's see, are there any questions at this point? I am not seeing anybody pop up with a hand, but okay, go right ahead. Okay, great. So um, we're going to just zoom out. Um, let's see, some of these gold lines here indicate county boundaries. I've left those in without labeling the counties themselves. I think we all more or less know where Vermont's counties are, but uh, these help us um, orient where we are and uh, the county labels themselves are available upon request. So um, let's see, as you can see, as, we, as I pan around the map, some of these labels will change, jump, um, to different places. And that's because this mapping program is just rearranging these things automatically. It's also why not all of them will be displayed. So if we were to zoom into the Burlington area, you'll see more and more of these labels pop up as more and more of these districts become clear. And Representative Gannon, I believe you have a question. Go ahead, Rep Gannon. Not so much a question, but a statement. Um, if people are using a laptop, um, if you look at, at your, the upper part of your screen, there are view options. And so when I when Nick originally pulls this up, it's the view option is fit to window. And so it's a lot smaller. So if you go to 100% original size, it, it looks a lot bigger on your screen and it's a lot easier to, to read. So um, if you're on a laptop, you might want to try that. Right, so view options and then zoom ratio. And if you look at the little uh, triangle, it will give you options to look at it 50% view, 100% uh, or even larger. So um, trying 100% might help you be able to see better. So um, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to how I'm going to be using this uh, map in committee um th this is like i said a draft map using this file that we're looking at i can print um, static pdf maps with a little bit of uh, preparation time and um, i can also if i wanted to start readjust start adjusting some of these boundaries and we could get um live update information on what the changes would uh, reveal um, but for the moment, I just wanted to demonstrate how we can navigate around the map to take a look at various things as they are currently drawn and um, make sure that that, ever, that works for everyone. I'm working on ways to try to make this program work a little bit better via Zoom and working on map design um, uh, standards to try to make just the whole thing look easier. Um, I think what I will probably do in addition to the current information that we have on the labels is add the number of members per district because currently it's not shown. It's pretty easy to infer, but uh, it would just make self, save everyone a little bit of math 
uh, if we were to do that. So I'll update the labels with those and um, any other uh, requests for information um, or, or, uh, or display, please let me know and I will do my best to accommodate those. Representative and Anthony has his hand up. Representative Anthony, you're muted. And, and we can christen you the first uh, year on mute of 2022. So happy new year. Happy new year in return. Anyway, Nick, uh, uh, there presumably, I tried this uh, earlier on with the majority map. If you um, zoom in, uh, I, can, I can obviously figure out or infer why the lines are all squiggly. There must be in some districts. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there a legend that goes with this so I could understand that a district line, for instance, follows the Ottaquichi River or some such, so I can make some sense of it? Or will those uh, kind of details pop up when I go to, you know, 200% or 300% uh, uh, resolution? So that's going to be another one of the limitations, um, and it's a really good point. It's another limitation of doing this by Zoom because the static maps that you'll see are, um, they are what they are, whereas um, right now Nick is in the Maptitude program, and you we all noticed that as he was zooming closer into Chittenden County, we began to see rivers and streets and airports and parks and water bodies, um, and so and this now, the zoom that we're at right now is actually showing us at the census block level. So if you needed to find 200 people, you could look along the border and find 200 people, um, you know, to, to switch districts around. This is what I'm hoping, this level of, uh, of manipulation of maps, I'm hoping we will do when we're physically present in the building. Um, uh, because it is, it's extremely challenging and it's not something that is easily um, exportable to us to play around with it at home. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. So Nick, back to you with any other orientation that you want to show us. Um, actually, I think your your last point kind of said it all, Madam Chair. That's basically what uh, um, I was hoping to... The, point I was hoping to make. Um, this provides us, what's on screen now provides us with a pretty good example of that. Um, we can see along here, there is the Winooski River. It is labeled, there's a town, there's a green town line between Burlington and Winooski. Um, although you can see that the district purple line does not fall along that. In fact, it falls somewhat south into Burlington, encompasses this area bounded by what I assume is Riverside Drive. And each of these null numbers tells you how many people are living in each one of those uh, census blocks. So um, that's also why the Winooski's population of 7,997 people does not match the uh, district population of 8,563 people, despite the district almost perfectly overlaying Winooski, the geographically speaking. So um, this uh, is the, like, a, uh, like um, Madam Chair was saying, this is the sort of granular detail that we can get into, although there is a bit of a trade-off on being able to, in terms of visualization, being able to show, display this sort of information um, on this district level versus at the state level. Um, that's pretty much it, but um, that's sort of what we are working with in terms of the power of this um, mapping software and uh, when we actually start, or if we end up um, starting to change district boundaries from what they are currently drawn, we can use these census blocks as the smallest geographic or demographic units by which to manipulate boundaries and the size of districts. Yeah. Uh, that's really all I have in terms of a basic introduction, and I'm happy to just take questions um, and comments from here on out. Great, Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. That last comment that Nick made, um, are we restricted in actually breaking up a census block to uh, meet some kind of parity or um, geographic boundary sort of 
the census block is the smallest unit of known population that we have in our uh, in in the in our data, and uh, and so you'll see some of these blocks have you know zero or fourteen or other blocks have you know two hundred and twenty nine people in them, and uh, so for the purposes of of places where uh, you know where we're crossing. Um, other political subdivisions will be the smallest unit that we can use is that census block unit. Representative Anthony. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> that gives me pause. I once upon a time was a, uh, a census uh, go-to go guy collector um, of uh, current population survey information, income, wages, and whatnot. And the interesting thing is the census blocks are not designed, unlike our statute and our charge under the statute, they are not designed uh, to follow any kind of uh, logic that you and I normally are familiar with, either, either geographic boundaries like mountains or or rivers or um, political subdivisions or wards. So while you are perfectly right, that's the most granular data you have. The interesting thing is the census block for our purposes is really uh, ripe for manipulation in the sense of putting them together or taking uh, uh, combinations uh, of each of them uh, for purely numerical convenience, since they don't represent any uh, of the statutory um, standards that we are confronting when we undertake the task anyway. Other questions for Nick on what we are looking at and, and uh, how we are going to be able to um, communicate with MAPS during this remote meeting time. All right, well, let's go ahead and go off screen share uh, so that we can resume our virtual room here. And um, so um, committee, any questions for, uh, for Nick or Amron before we take a quick break and then dive into the alternate map um, that the LAB, um, uh, didn't choose. All right. Um, so committee, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Welcome you all to um, resume good uh, Zooming protocol and hygiene and get out and do some stretching, move around, get yourself something to drink, maybe some fresh air. And